Hi, welcome to my ECG video blog. I'm Ken Grauer, and this is my 12th ECG video blog. This is the third and final part in my video series on the basics of rhythm diagnosis. In this video, I'll begin with a case that will review many of the key concepts that we've covered thus far. I'll then discuss the remaining concepts in this introduction to rhythm diagnosis, which entail assessment of premature beats, ventricular rhythms, and the basics of aberrant conduction. I'll assume that by now you are comfortable with material presented in parts one and two of this video series. If not, feel free to review these first two parts at any time. As always, links to all of my videos and my other ECG materials on cardiac arrhythmias can be found at www aafpecg.com. Here is my email address. Please write me with your comments, feedback, and questions. On to today's topic. We begin with a case. The patient is a middle-aged man with a known history of heart disease. He presents with new onset palpitations and this rhythm. What would you do next? Hint. What is the first thing to do when confronted with any patient who presents with a fast rhythm? The answer is look at the patient first before you begin to worry too much about the rhythm. The good news in this case is that this patient is hemodynamically stable, which means that you do have at least a moment of time to systematically assess the rhythm. One of the major points we hope to emphasize in this video series is that it should take no more than a very few seconds to systematically run through the P's, Q's, 3R approach for virtually any rhythm. So, how to assess this rhythm? Let's start with P waves. Is there evidence of atrial activity? And we fully acknowledge that we were not certain when we first saw this tracing if atrial activity was or was not present. What we can say with certainty is that normal sinus P waves are not present because there is no upright P wave preceding each QRS in this lead too. Instead, negative deflections, red arrows, precede each QRS. In fact, the negative deflection that follows each QRS within the red circle might also represent atrial activity, as suggested by the additional red arrows. So we suspect that there is regular non-sinus atrial activity that is related to the QRS, but we don't yet know this for certain. Continuing with the P's, Q's, 3R approach, the QRS complex looks to be narrow, although admittedly, we only have a single monitoring lead to go by, which leaves us with the three R's. The rhythm is regular, and if these negative deflections do in fact represent atrial activity, they appear to be related to the QRS. And the rate of this rhythm is about 150 per minute as suggested by the R to R interval of two large boxes. So even though we do not know definitive answers at this point for each of the five parameters, we have narrowed down the possibilities for this rhythm. Diagnostically, what might we do at this point to help us determine what this rhythm truly is? One of the things to do diagnostically at this point in the process would be to obtain a 12-lead ECG during the tachycardia. That's because 12 leads are better than one. Ideally, the 12-lead ECG you obtain will have a simultaneously recorded long lead two rhythm strip at the bottom, as shown here. We realize that not all of the in-field ECG recorders are capable of recording a simultaneous long lead two, in which case you do what you can. 
It's also possible that you may be in a situation in which you are not even able to obtain a 12 lead ECG during the tachycardia. We simply wish to illustrate that when you can get a 12 lead, how helpful this can be. Potential benefits of doing a 12 lead during the tachycardia include the following. It helps to verify if the QRS complex is wide or narrow. While we thought the QRS looked narrow, in this case, a quick glance at the other 11 leads on this tracing confirms this beyond question. A 12 lead obtained during the tachycardia also clarifies the presence and nature of atrial activity. We thought the negative deflections in the lead to rhythm strip we initially saw might represent atrial activity. We can confirm this with a 12 lead, which shows similar extra deflections occurring at twice the ventricular rate in many leads. Note that these deflections occur precisely in time with the negative deflections we saw in the lead to rhythm strip, vertical blue lines. A third potential benefit of doing a 12 lead ECG during the tachycardia is that it provides information about QRS morphology and the frontal plane axis. When the QRS is wide, this information may help for distinguishing between SVT versus ventricular tachycardia. But we now know for certain that the QRS in this tracing is definitely not wide. Let's review what we have established. This was the lead to rhythm strip we were given for this hemodynamically stable patient who presented with palpitations. We assess this rhythm by the P's, Q's, 3R approach. Since the patient was stable, we had the luxury of time to obtain a 12 lead ECG during tachycardia. With the benefit of the 12 lead ECG to assist us, we establish that the rhythm is a regular tachycardia. Since the R to R interval is about two large boxes in duration, the rate is approximately 300 divided by two or about 150 per minute. Normal sinus P waves are absent since we do not clearly see an upright P wave in lead two. The QRS complex is narrow. That is, the QRS is not more than half a large box in duration. This defines this regular tachycardia as being supraventricular in etiology, that is, arising from at or above the AV node. Thus, this rhythm is a regular SVT, that is, a regular supraventricular tachycardia in which we do not see normal sinus P waves. The point that we wish to emphasize is the process. Even when you think you know what the rhythm is, it is best not to jump to a specific diagnosis, but rather to approach each and every rhythm you encounter by a systematic approach. First, ensure that the patient is stable, because if the patient is not stable because of the fast rate, then you may need to immediately cardiovert the patient regardless of what the rhythm happens to be. Once you know that the patient is stable, go through the P's, Q's, 3 R's. With practice, this systematic approach will not slow you down. On the contrary, Systematic assessment by the P's, Q's, 3 R's will speed up your interpretation with the extra benefit of increasing your accuracy. By being systematic, you won't overlook important findings. This brings up the first of two lists that we would like you to memorize. These lists are easy to remember. You'll find that use of these lists will greatly facilitate the diagnosis of the common tachycardias. So whenever you encounter a regular SVT rhythm in which you cannot clearly identify normal upright P waves and lead two, think of three rhythms. These are sinus tachycardia, if perhaps sinus P waves are hiding in the preceding ST segment, PSVT, also known as AVNRT, which we described in detail at the end of part two in this video series, and atrial flutter. Other arrhythmias may also produce a regular SVT rhythm, 
such as avenodal tachycardia or atrial tachycardia. But in our experience, over 90% of the regular SVT rhythms that you will see either in or out of a hospital setting will be one of these three rhythms. So which of these three entities is most likely to be the rhythm diagnosis here? We can, at least, rule out sinus tachycardia because we can clearly see that there is no upright P wave in lead two. That said, we strongly suspect that there is atrial activity because of the extra deflections we saw in several leads on the 12 lead ECG. And we remember from part two of this video series that atrial flutter is by far the most commonly overlooked rhythm diagnosis, especially when the QRS complex is narrow and the ventricular rate close to 150 per minute but we'd like to know this for certain in order to optimize our treatment decisions. So what could we do diagnostically? This is where use of a vagal maneuver can really help. The vagal maneuver was applied here, blue arrow. What happens? The answer is that the ventricular response temporarily slows while the vagal maneuver is being applied. We now see evidence of definite regular atrial activity occurring at an interval of approximately one large box in duration, which corresponds to a regular atrial rate of about 300 per minute. The only thing that does this is atrial flutter. We can now verify that the negative deflection just after each QRS within the red circle was a flutter wave as was the negative deflection just before each QRS. Seeing this 2 to 1 atrial activity rules out AVNRT and allows us to make a definitive diagnosis of atrial flutter. It's time to move on. I call this next segment in this three-part video series on rhythm diagnosis prematurity as it covers the common types of beats that occur earlier than expected. So, prematurity and premature beats. There are three types of early or premature beats. These are easiest to understand if we correlate physiologic events to the normal cardiac cycle. With normal sinus conduction, the normal electrical impulse begins in the SA node, travels rapidly through the atria, and then on to the ventricles. What happens with PACs, or premature atrial contractions? Here, the next atrial impulse begins earlier than expected, from somewhere within the atria. The impulse then travels to the AV node, and from there it is conducted normally to the ventricles. As a result, on the ECG, the underlying rhythm is sinus. There are one or more early beats which usually show an early occurring P wave that looks different than the normal sinus P wave. But conduction to the ventricles occurs normally, so that the QRS complex is narrow and looks identical to the QRS of normal sinus beats. We schematically show a PAC on this lead to rhythm strip. Beat number four occurs earlier than expected. Note that beat number four is preceded by a premature P wave that looks different than the P wave of normal sinus beats within the blue circle. However, the QRS complex is narrow and looks identical to the QRS of normal sinus beats within the blue rectangle. So PACs are the first type of early beat. The second type of early beat consists of PJCs, or premature junctional contractions. Here, the early impulse arises from the AV node. It is then conducted normally to the ventricles. As we discussed in detail in part two of this video series, there will either be a negative P wave in lead two with junctional beats or no P wave at all. The QRS should be narrow and look similar, if not identical, to the QRS of normal sinus beats. Beat number six shows what a PJC may look like. 
Note that the QRS complex is narrow. Beat number six is preceded by a negative P wave in this lead two with a short PR interval within the blue circle. Beyond the core. Technically, we cannot be certain if beat number six is a PJC. It could be a PAC arising from low down in the atria or from the coronary sinus. Clinically, this distinction does not matter because management of PACs and PJCs is virtually identical. We simply want to illustrate what a PJC may look like. It's an early beat with a narrow QRS that may be preceded by a negative P wave in lead two or by no P wave at all. For practical purposes, the point to remember is that the overwhelming majority of early occurring narrow beats are PACs, even when they are preceded by a negative P wave. PVCs make up the last category of early occurring beats. Here, the early impulse arises from the ventricles. As a result, the QRS complex is wide and not preceded by a premature P wave. On this rhythm strip, beat number eight is a PVC. Note the wide and very different looking QRS complex for beat number eight with no early P wave in front of it within the large blue oval. So keep in mind these three types of early beats. In the next slide, we'll take these concepts one step further. So, Keeping in mind these three types of early occurring beats, what's going on here? The first three beats in this lead to rhythm strip are sinus. What then happens? The answer is that beat number four occurs early. And if we look closely at this early occurring beat within the blue rectangle, the QRS complex of beat number four is narrow and it looks the same as the QRS of normal sinus beats. In addition, beat number four is preceded by a premature P wave that clearly looks different than the P wave of normal sinus beats within the red oval. Beat number four is a PAC. What then happens? Can we explain what we see on this tracing for beat number six? The QRS complex of beat number six is not narrow. Instead, it is wide, and it looks different than the QRS of normal sinus beats. That said, beat number six is preceded by an early occurring P wave that looks different from the P wave of normal sinus beats within the red oval. So beat number six is a PAC with the reason for QRS widening being that the P wave preceding beat number six, red arrow, is conducted with aberrancy. The point to emphasize is that sometimes early supraventricular impulses, that is PACs or PJCs, may conduct with a wide QRS despite the fact that these beats are supraventricular. More on aberrant conduction in a moment. Before we explain aberrant conduction, let's finish review on the types of early beats with these next two examples. Once again, the rhythm begins with three normal sinus beats. Beat number four occurs early. The QRS complex of beat number four is narrow, and beat number four is not preceded by any P wave in this lead to rhythm strip. Therefore, beat number four is a PJC. What then happens? After a slight pause, sinus rhythm resumes with beat number five, after which another early beat occurs. Beat number six within the blue rectangle occurs early. Its QRS is wide and there is no preceding P wave. Beat number six is a PVC. Final point. Although there are occasions when the QRS may be wide with a PAC or PJC, a wide early beat should be presumed guilty, that is presumed to be a PVC, until proven otherwise. Let me preface this next slide 
by alerting you that its content does go beyond the basics, with my goal being simply to explore a bit more on the concept of aberrant conduction. If this is all new to you, then I'm happy if I leave you with nothing more than an appreciation that supraventricular impulses may sometimes conduct with a wide QRS. For listeners already aware of aberrant conduction, these next few minutes will hopefully take your skill to the next level. It all relates to the refractory period. This is the R to R interval, which is simply the duration of time between two QRS complexes. Following contraction, that is, after the QRS complex, there occurs what is known as the ARP or the absolute refractory period, schematically shown as the shaded blue rectangle. During the ARP, no early impulse, no matter how strong, can be conducted to the ventricles, blue arrow, because the entire conduction system is in an absolute refractory state during the ARP. Therefore, a PAC occurring during the ARP will be blocked that is, not conducted. This means that no QRS will follow a premature P wave that occurs during the ARP. In contrast to the ARP is the RRP, or relative refractory period, schematically shown within the yellow rectangle. During the RRP, a portion of the conduction system remains in an absolute refractory state, but some portion of the conduction system is able to conduct. This is followed by recovery. A PAC that occurs after recovery of the conduction system, red arrow, can once again conduct normally. So a PAC occurring within this red zone will conduct with a narrow QRS complex that is identical to the QRS of normal sinus beats. Aberrant conduction occurs when a PAC occurs during the RRP. Let's see what this looks like. The rhythm begins with three normal sinus beats. Beat number four occurs early. The QRS of beat number four is narrow and identical to the QRS of normal sinus beats. And beat number four is preceded by a different looking premature P wave red arrow. Beat number four is a PAC. On our diagram, since the QRS of beat number four is narrow and identical to the QRS of normal sinus beats, this PAC must be occurring after recovery. Not so for the PAC that occurs just after beat number five, within the blue circle. The blue arrow highlights that there is a PAC that is hidden within the T wave of beat number five, as indicated by an unmistakable notch in this T wave that is not seen in the T wave of any of the normal sinus beats. This PAC is blocked. That is, it occurs so early in the cycle that it must be within the ARP when no premature impulse, no matter how strong, can conduct. We've measured the coupling intervals of these two PACs for you. As predicted, the coupling interval or distance between the normally conducted QRS and the premature P wave is longer preceding the PAC of beat number four because this PAC occurs later after recovery of conduction system properties within the red zone of our figure. Compare this with what happens for the last PAC, which is beat number seven. Note that the QRS of beat number seven looks different than all other QRS complexes on this tracing. Nevertheless, this beat number seven is preceded by a premature P wave, yellow arrow. The reason for the different appearance of this QRS complex is that this PAC occurs during the relative refractory period and is conducted with aberrancy. Note that its coupling interval, 28 milliseconds, is intermediate between the coupling interval of the PAC that was blocked, blue arrow, and the PAC that was conducted normally, 
red arrow. The key to understanding aberrant conduction is that the QRS of aberrantly conducted beats will usually look like some form of either bundle branch block or hemi block. What form it takes will depend on the relative refractory period of each conduction system component for that particular patient. In general, the right bundle branch has the longest relative refractory period in most patients. That's why the most common morphology of aberrantly conducted beats is with a QRS complex that looks like right bundle branch block. But any conduction fascicle may have a longer relative refractory period in a given patient. So in this example, beat number seven with a predominantly negative QRS complex in lead two is conducting with left anterior hemiblock aberration. Enough on aberrancy. Let's now apply all of this clinically. Here's a rhythm that's a bit challenging, but one that will highlight a number of important points. First, note that the monitoring lead used is not a lead two. Instead, it is an MCL1 lead. This is not one of the usual leads from a standard 12 lead ECG, but rather a lead that is commonly used during cardiac monitoring, either in a hospital or emergency setting. It's all part of the principle that more leads are better than one. Advantages of MCL1 monitoring are that P waves are often well seen in this lead, sometimes even better than in lead two. And MCL1 provides an excellent right-sided perspective of ECG events, which can be very helpful when assessing for right bundle branch block aberration. Just be aware that sinus P waves will not always be upright in MCL1, as they are in lead two and also be aware of the need to always check which lead is being monitored. The next principle brought out by interpreting this tracing is that we are presented with an irregular rhythm that is not atrial fibrillation. The reason this is not AFib is that there are P waves, red arrows, which brings up the next important principle, which is when interpreting a rhythm that is not straightforward, as in this case, look for an underlying rhythm. Start with what you know. We know that the QRS complex is narrow, as each QRS is clearly not more than half a large box in duration within the red rectangle. So is there an underlying rhythm? To answer this question, look in front of each QRS complex seen on this tracing. Note that each QRS is preceded by a P wave with a fixed PR interval. Therefore, the underlying rhythm in this tracing is sinus, but something else is going on. This brings up the last principle that we'll introduce regarding this tracing namely that the most common cause of a pause is a blocked PAC. Awareness of this reality will prove invaluable when assessing for AV block, since blocked PACs are far more common than any AV block that you'll see. So whenever we see a relative pause in the rhythm, as we do here after beats one, three, and five, Look to see if the cause of the pause might be a blocked PAC. Now, carefully look at the T wave at the beginning of the relative pause within the blue circle. Compare this to the T wave of normal sinus beats within the red circle. Note the unmistakable notch in the T wave at the beginning of the pause, blue arrow. Beats number four and five are two more normal sinus beats, and then we once again see a notch in the T wave of beat number five that is not seen in the T wave of beat number four. So the rhythm is sinus with blocked PACs. As we stated at the outset, this was a challenging tracing, but by applying the basic principles we describe, you now have the tools to interpret even challenging tracings such as this one. Let's now look a little closer at premature ventricular beats.
Along the way, we need to clarify some definitions. We'll start with this schematic tracing, which begins with three sinus beats. What then happens? The answer is that beat number four occurs early and its QRS is wide. Since we've been talking about aberrant conduction, is beat number four a PAC conducted with aberrancy? Or I should say, why is this early widened beat number four a PVC and not a PAC? There are several reasons. First, statistically, most early widened beats are PVCs and not aberrantly conducted PACs. Our approach needs to start from this perspective. It is therefore best to presume that an early widened beat or a run of widened beats is guilty, that is ventricular in etiology, unless we can definitively prove that the wide beats are not ventricular. Beat number four in this tracing is wide. Its QRS looks very different from the QRS of normal sinus beats within the blue rectangle, and careful scrutiny of the preceding T wave, that is the T wave of beat number three, does not reveal any preceding P wave. Therefore, we can confidently say that beat number four is a PVC. As emphasized earlier, the concept of aberrant conduction is an advanced one. We do want to make you aware of this possibility, but unless you can clearly prove aberrant conduction, for example, by detecting a premature P wave before the widened beat or beats, think ventricular until you can prove otherwise. Sinus rhythm resumes with beats number five and six. What then happens? We now see two wide beats in a row. Beats number seven and eight are PVCs because beat number seven is not preceded by any premature P wave and QRS morphology of these two wide beats is identical to QRS morphology of beat number four, which we know to be a PVC. The occurrence of two PVCs in a row is called a ventricular couplet. Clinically, the occurrence of repetitive forms of ventricular ectopy, that is, seeing two or more PVCs in a row, is of much more concern than seeing isolated PVCs, as this increases the risk that the patient may develop VT or ventricular tachycardia. Sinus rhythm resumes with beat number nine. Beat number 10 is another widened early beat, blue arrow. Is this another PVC? Why does the QRS of beat number 10 look different than the other three PVCs seen earlier on this tracing? Beat number 10 is another PVC because this beat is very wide and looks very different than the QRS of normal sinus beats. It is not preceded by any premature P wave. The reason QRS morphology looks so different from the QRS of the other PVCs is that this PVC either arises from a different site in the ventricles or is following a different path through the ventricles. Descriptively, we say there are multiform PVCs when QRS morphology of ventricular beats differs like this. Continuing with our definitions, how would you describe what happens beginning with beat number four? The rhythm once again starts with three normal sinus beats. We then see three consecutive widened beats, blue arrows, until normal sinus rhythm resumes with beat number seven. These three all negative white beats look very much like the PVCs we just saw in the previous tracing. This run of three wide beats is not preceded by any premature P wave. That is, the T wave of beat number three is smooth within the blue circle, just like the T wave of the normal sinus beats within the red circles. We would expect a notch or some other deformity in the T wave of beat number three if this was a run of aberrant conduction that was precipitated by a premature P wave. 
Given the absence of evidence in favor of aberrant conduction, we interpret beats number four, five, and six as a ventricular salvo or triplet, that is three PVCs in a row. The definition of VT, that is ventricular tachycardia, is three or more PVCs in a row. Clinically, we find it most useful to simply describe what we see. For example, following three sinus beats, there is a short three-beat run of VT. What then happens? Following beat number eight, we now see a five-beat run of VT. This brings up the last two definitions that we'll introduce, which are NSVT, if ventricular tachycardia is non-sustained, and sinus rhythm resumes before too long of a time period has passed versus sustained VT, in which the episode of VT lasts longer. Even the experts don't always agree on how long is long enough for an episode of VT to qualify as being sustained. Perhaps more than 15 seconds is long enough Probably, if the episode of VT is long enough to give you palpitations, it qualifies as sustained VT. How long is the episode of VT that we see here, beginning with beat number 9? The answer is that we have no idea as to how long this episode of VT lasts, because the tracing is cut off after beat number 13. All we can do is describe what we see. Beginning with beat number nine, there is a five beat run of all negative widened beats without any preceding premature P wave. This run of VT looks to be fairly regular with an R to R interval of approximately two large boxes in duration. So the rate of this five beat run is 300 divided by two or about 150 per minute which is certainly fast enough to cause problems if it persists. Additional monitoring would be needed to tell if this represents a run of NSVT or a longer lasting run of sustained VT. Clinical correlation is then needed to tell us if treatment with antiarrhythmic medication or electrical cardioversion is indicated. What happens now? The rhythm begins with four normal sinus beats before we see a widened beat that is not preceded by a premature P wave. Question, is beat number five a PVC black arrow? Hint, does beat number five occur early or late? The answer of course is that beat number five occurs late. This distinction in timing is critical in our assessment of the rhythm. The P in PVC stands for premature. So by definition, PVCs are ventricular beats that occur earlier than expected, as was shown over the last few slides, blue arrows. In contrast, beat number five here clearly occurs later than expected, which defines it as an escape beat. Beat number five should have occurred here, white arrow. Instead, it occurs late, black arrow, which is why we call it an escape beat. We identify the site of escape as being in the ventricles because the QRS complex of beat number five is wide and beat number five is not preceded by any P wave. Something must have happened to the SA node, since after four normal sinus beats, there all of a sudden is no sinus P wave. Possibilities include sinus node suppression due to medication use, sinus node exit block, and sick sinus syndrome, to name just a few. As we discussed in part two of this video series, escape beats are a good thing. This is because if the primary problem is sinus arrest with complete cessation of sinus node function, then the resultant rhythm could be a systole if no escape rhythm comes to the rescue. Clearly, a slow ventricular escape rhythm is better than no rhythm at all.
Bottom line, PVCs are different than escape beats. Escape beats are easy to recognize because unlike PVCs, they occur later than expected. We'll conclude this video series with two final tracings that will hopefully tie together many of the key concepts we have covered. As with our approach to any arrhythmia, we begin with assessment of the five parameters. Here is the first tracing. As a reminder, in real life, our immediate reaction on seeing a rhythm such as this on the monitor will be to look at the patient, as we need to be certain that the patient is hemodynamically stable before doing anything else. If not, then regardless of what this rhythm may happen to be, immediate cardioversion will be indicated. Remember, the fastest way to convert a fast rhythm is with electricity that is, delivering a synchronized electrical discharge with cardioversion. But the point to emphasize is that some patients may remain alert and hemodynamically stable despite being in sustained VT for surprisingly long periods of time, for hours or even longer. This patient was hemodynamically stable at the time this rhythm was recorded. This gives us the luxury of at least a little bit of time to assess this rhythm by the P's, Q's, 3R approach, realizing that if at any time during the assessment process, the patient's condition deteriorates, that prompt shock will then be indicated. The rhythm looks to be regular. The QRS is obviously wide. No P waves are seen in this lead to rhythm strip. By the every other beat method, the R to R interval of every other beat is between three to four large boxes in duration. So half the rate is about 85 per minute. Therefore, the actual rate is 85 times two, or about 170 per minute. Putting this all together, we have described this rhythm as a regular WCT, that is, wide complex tachycardia in which we do not see normal sinus P waves. As this is a video series on the basics of rhythm interpretation, detailed discussion of QRS morphology during the WCT rhythm, as well as other intricacies of our differential diagnosis, extends beyond the scope of what we can realistically achieve. So I'll summarize and simplify key aspects of our assessment as follows. If the patient is hemodynamically stable, I like to get a 12 lead ECG during the tachycardia as soon as you are able to do so. The 12 lead during the tachycardia may be of great help diagnostically. Even if you can't get a 12 lead during the tachycardia, we can say the following from simple assessment of this lead to rhythm strip. This rhythm could be supraventricular, with QRS widening due either to a pre-existing bundle branch block or aberrant conduction. Rarely, patients with WPW may also develop PSVT that conducts in the forward direction over the accessory pathway to the ventricles, resulting in QRS widening. So that is also a possibility. Or this regular WCT rhythm could be VT, ventricular tachycardia. Which is more likely? We want you to remember that statistically, the literature has taught us that at least 80, if not 90% or more of regular WCT rhythms without sinus P waves are ventricular tachycardia. So our list of the causes of a rhythm such as this one looks like this. Number nine is probably VT. And it is only for cause number 10 that we should be thinking about something else, such as pre-existing bundle branch block, aberrant conduction, or WPW. The bottom line is that unless we can prove otherwise, we should always assume the rhythm is VT and treat the patient accordingly. Last tracing. The patient is hemodynamically stable. 
we'll again use the P's, Q's, 3R approach. Here is the rhythm. It's from an MCL1 monitoring lead. To begin, is there any underlying rhythm? The underlying rhythm is sinus, as shown by the presence of regularly occurring P waves with fixed PR interval preceding each of the first five beats, red arrows. What then happens? We can see within the red rectangle development of a regular WCT rhythm beginning with beat number six. But unlike the previous slide, this is not VT. Why not? The key lies with what happens at the onset of the tachycardia within the T wave of beat number five. What do you see? Blue arrow. Looking closely and comparing the T wave for each of the normal sinus beats, isn't there a difference? That is, the T wave for each of the first four beats in this tracing is smooth within the red circles whereas it is notched for the T wave of beat number five that occurs just before onset of the Y tachycardia. This notching represents a PAC, and this rhythm is SVT, with the reason for QRS widening being aberrant conduction. We emphasize that this case is the exception, since most of the time, regular WCT rhythms will be VT but on occasion, you will be able to make a definitive diagnosis of aberrant conduction. We simply wanted to illustrate how this might be done. That's it for our third and final part of this video series on the basics of rhythm interpretation. Please remember this link for easy access to our material on cardiac arrhythmias. This is Ken Grauer saying goodbye for now. Du plus loin que me revienne l'ombre de mes amours anciennes, du plus loin du premier rendez-vous.